perhaps many times there was a, was a sense about the south side of Milwaukee, or at least this particular area of the south side, that it was a kind of a closed community, and it was a closed community with regard to the basilica itself that the, the basilica was kind of the, the symbol of, of, of the neighborhood. In one sense, yes, but it wasn't a symbol of, of, of being closed to the neighborhood. Growing up, I've always uh, thought of the south side of Milwaukee as being, uh, how do I say, kind of a all the same. Uh, cookie cutter houses, cookie cutter people, uh, and uh, mainly Polish people that lived on the uh, south side and kind of a, a closed community to anything but. Uh, nowadays I live actually live on the south side and I realize it's uh, really not uh, like that. It's actually quite opposite of what I've always heard uh, growing up. Milwaukee's Old South Side once comprised approximately two square miles at the southern border of the city. The area was settled by Polish immigrants who began arriving in large numbers in the 1870s. But the neighborhood was never exclusively Polish. In the neighborhood were Polish, um, Serbians, Croatians, some Spanish. Now, as the time has changed, we have Hindus, we have Arabs, we have Polish, we have also a lot of Hispanic people. We have the German, the Polish, a lot of Spanish, and also the Hmong. And because of that, we're um, doing all the different cultures and learning from each other, and it's, and it's been a great experience living here. Historically, the area's two largest ethnic groups have been Poles and Latinos of Mexican descent. The Poles were the first to settle on the Old South Side. They were joined by Latinos in the 1970s, although they represented different cultures separated by language as well as time of arrival. The two groups brought many common cultural traits and experiences to the neighborhood. Poles and Latinos both faced language barriers they had to overcome. The Polish and Mexican immigrants were overwhelmingly Roman Catholic, and both brought in mystical and healing practices. This parish, of course, was founded by Polish people in 1883, and uh, now more and more the neighborhood is changing, and more and more Hispanics are coming to the church. And not only in Milwaukee, but in major metropolitan areas throughout the United States, Hispanics choose to uh, live alongside Eastern European groups for some reason or other. Perhaps there is a psychological attraction uh, because both groups are primarily Roman Catholic. Both groups have a very uh, deep devotion to the Mother of God under different titles. When I was uh, small, my grandmother uh, lived with us, my mother's mother, and she had her own ideas of how to treat us when we'd get sick. So if when we were tiny babies, if we had stomach upsets, she would give us uh, chamomile tea. In Polish, that's called rumianic. And you'd make a weak tea and dilute it with the water and, and give it to the baby in the bottle to settle their stomach. And um, my dad, if his stomach was upset or he was in different things, we always had... Um, oil of wintergreen, green drops that we took, and f boiled up flaxseed, and different herbs like uh, javanna, which was also kind of um, good for um, upset stomachs and stuff like that. During their earliest years in the neighborhood, most Poles and Latinos relied on extended family networks for economic support. Both groups also maintained similar early patterns in gender roles. When young people got married and couldn't afford to get a place of their own like they do now, an apartment or a house or, or a condo, 
they would move in with older relatives. I know my grandparents, when they got married, which would have been in the 1920s, they moved in with an elderly aunt and uncle who had no children, and they just rented two rooms from them and helped with the housework and the yard work and all the cooking and sort of had a combined household until they could afford to save up enough money to go out on their own. In turn, when this aunt and uncle became elderly and couldn't manage, it was their turn to take them in and take care of them. Even though the ethnic groups have changed, one thing that they do have in common is that uh, the way they live, uh, they're more family oriented and somehow they can have one or two generations there. The grandmas play the role of the babysitters and the uncles and the cousins uh, participate in the care of the children. The ethnic groups are different, but it seems like the social ties and the method of organizing or socializing is the same. Women played a huge part in the various social groups and uh, fraternal groups that were very prevalent in earlier Polonia, uh, primarily because women stayed at home and they were able to do a lot of these things. It was a chance for them to socialize. Uh, men held the, the important positions. They were the board members. They were the chairman of different things. The man had his thing, which was probably more, ma well, it was more masculine, you know, politics and getting involved in the neighborhood, you know, um, especially politics. But, uh, yeah, there was a separation. Poles and Mexican-Americans on the south side tended to enjoy similar leisure time activities, which nearly always centered around religion, ethnic foods, and the neighborhood's Kosciuszko Park. Recreational activities for both groups were multi-generational. One of the interesting things about the neighborhood during the summer is that having proximity to the Kosciuszko Park, uh, it allowed the different ethnic groups, ethnic groups to congregate and yet remain certain level of independence. Uh, in, the nor in the near east side, most of the Serbian community had their soccer clubs and their restaurants. Um, the Polish soccer club was mainly in Hayes and 10th Street in Hayes as well, and also some Spanish soccer clubs. The only time that you would have an idea to see the diversity of the soccer clubs was during the summer and during Sundays before and after the games. Our entertainment really revolved around the family and most frequently on weekends we would wind up at one or the other grandmother's house and uh, she was a magician because she would take uh, one chicken and uh, she'd be able to feed as many as 20, 30, 40 people because all the cousins and uncles and aunts and everyone came to grandma's house for Sunday dinner and then of course uh, playing games and uh, cards and uh, just enjoying uh, associating with one another. Uh, and of course each one had their festivals and the street festivals brought together a whole lot of people and I noticed in all the dances and street festivals that uh, the Polish as well as the Mexican-Americans uh, took their whole families with them, their children, um, and you see the parents and, and the brothers and sisters dancing with the little kids. So it was a family, family event which was very nice and very similar. Of course the music was very lively, um, the instruments might have been different, but the music was also similar as far as polkas and, and waltzes and, and, and dances like that. Most early arriving Poles and Latinos in the neighborhood came from rural backgrounds and had limited skills for urban employment. This often left both groups struggling economically for a time and facing prejudice from other Milwaukee populations. Polish people began to come to the United States in large numbers after the Civil War. They came with very little. They didn't speak the English language. Many of them were very poorly educated, and they didn't have very many economic uh, resources to help them establish themselves in this country. Uh, we came up here from Texas, and we were um, going to Sturgeon Bay and areas up north to do uh, cherry picking and things like this, all different kinds of fruits and vegetables. But one thing I remember is um, there were so many different cousins and brothers and sisters. We were all jammed into uh, There'd be like three or four families jammed into one house, you know, but we did what we could just to get by. Poles and Latinos in the neighborhood demonstrated very strong work ethics and a willingness to take entry-level jobs. 
Many also sent money back to their homelands. As the neighborhood changes, the Hispanic presence is more evident. Uh, there's mainly young people, uh, first generation, blue collar. Uh, one thing that makes it interesting is their tenacity and their willingness to do the basic chores that nobody wants to do. One of my observations, I think, is the uh, value that, that people place, many people in the Polish community place on hard work. Uh, the early immigrants came from a primarily peasant background where education was not a particular benefit um, to earning a livelihood. In fact, it could even be a hindrance. And even after they came here, most of them worked as manual laborers, where again, education wasn't a particular uh, enhancement. A lot of the Hispanics worked in foundries, worked on the railroads, worked in tan uh, not only the tanneries, but um, the other factories, International Harvester. My, my dad worked at all his charmers for 40 years. A lot of them came over, they would work, and they would send money to uh, Mexico. Polish and Mexican immigrants usually left their homelands to escape political and economic oppression. Both groups tended to lean left politically during their early years in the neighborhood. Around the turn of the century, we have the rise of a movement that became very substantial in the city. It was the socialist movement, the socialist party movement. It was largely dominated by Germans because Milwaukee is a city that historically was over 50% made up of German people. But the, uh, the cause of the, of the socialists, which was the improvement of the conditions of workers, uh, good government, uh, reduced costs and prices for things like uh, uh, utilities, uh, transportation, electricity, gas. These kinds of concerns uh, were shared by all kinds of people. And of course, there were many Poles who in fact were attracted to the ideas of the socialist movement, and many of them ended up winning political office. Poles and Latinos had more in common than either group might have realized, and both groups faced the same principal challenges how to build and sustain strong communities. Polish immigration to America resulted from a combination of push-pull factors. Between 1795 and 1918, Poland was partitioned by Austria, Russia, and Prussia. In the 1870s, Prussian leader Bismarck initiated a Germanization policy in the western section of Poland, designed to bar speaking of languages other than German, impose a draft for the German army, weaken the Catholic Church, and replace Polish landowners with German citizens. This policy, coupled with the sharp drop in grain prices in the 1880s, led to massive emigrations of people from Poland in the late 19th century. The settlement areas became known as Polonias, or Polish-American communities. Polonias tended to be self-sustaining neighborhoods with intricate parish systems and a wealth of Polish institutions. One of these Polonias developed on Milwaukee's south side. Back in the late 1800s, uh, my great-grandfather, Stefan Rozga, uh, established the Rozga Funeral Home here on Lincoln Avenue in uh, 1898, what is now four generations of uh, of funeral directors from the Rosga family that have continued to serve here on Lincoln Avenue, uh, the families of the neighborhood. Most Poles who arrived in Milwaukee were intent on home and land ownership. Often their first paychecks went toward purchasing narrow lots where they would build three or four room cottages. However, as families grew and more relatives arrived, the homeowners lacked space on the lots to enlarge their homes. Often they raised the cottages and replaced the wood foundations with brick or cement block. 
this would create a semi-basement dwelling with a separate entrance for another family. The end products were called Polish flats. The Poles were quickly joined by a scattering of other ethnic groups, mainly from Europe. Together they developed a self-sufficient neighborhood and built scores of family-run businesses and factories along the streets of the old South Side. Lincoln Avenue had a lot of um, Polish merchants. One comes to mind, it was called Zdafka's. It was a, a huge poultry store in which all the chickens uh, were loose out in the backyard. You came in, you, you went out to the back, you picked your piece of poultry, and they would just kill it for you right then and there, and you took it home, and then you were responsible for plucking it and dressing it. The Polish language was preserved in the neighborhood well into the 1930s. At our graduation, I was asked to do the speech in, that I gave in Polish. <laughs> we didn't have an English speech, but I did have one in Polish. <laughs> that language eventually developed into what we laughingly called Mitchell Street Polish, and that was because of the combination of English and Polish. Poles trying to speak a little bit of English, mixing it with Polish, mixing it with a little German because there were German residents in the area, and this sort of hodgepodge language developed in which it was a little of English and a little of Polish. Some of the strongest assets in the mainly Polish neighborhood were the self-help institutions, the fraternals, relief organizations for the homeland, and cultural groups like Polanki. Lots of organizations. Uh, that was really our main social activity. That was it was really grouped around those fraternals because um, uh, it be, the fraternals were really and uh, uh, it was a um, uh, insurance. You had to take out an insurance policy in order to belong to these fraternals. So we all had policies that were maybe $300, $400. These pay pennies a week for that stuff, you know. But as I say, that was that became our main social uh, way of social activity as we were younger and into uh, growing up. It wasn't just to have um, insurance, like life insurance or house insurance, mostly life insurance policies. Um, they bought them from the Polish people because they, they um, a lot of them didn't speak English and these people spoke Polish, so they could uh, do business with them and they trusted them. But the fraternals, in addition to having that insurance component, were also the, the social network for these new immigrants. We also had a group, it was called Polish Relief, uh, where the people gathered clothing, and we used to, I used to go there as a young girl with my mother, and we would sort clothes, and they were then shipped to Poland. Uh, Polish Americans in Milwaukee played a, an important role uh, as part of the large national Polish American community on behalf of Poland's rebirth after the Second World War. Uh, Poland, of course, had been occupied by the Germans and then the Soviet Union. A uh, very important role there was in the work of uh, Judge Francis Świetlik. He had been the dean of Marquette University Law School, and he was a leader of the Polonia organizations, uh, one of which was called the Polish American Council. This organization raised something like about $150 million worth of material aid for Polish refugees and for people in Poland after the war. Polish Americans in Milwaukee and Wisconsin also took part in the creation of the Polish American Congress, a political action organization formed in 1944 at the very end of the war on behalf of the cause of America's victory in World War II and the restoration of an independent democratic Polish state. Polanki, the Polish Women's Cultural Club of Milwaukee, was founded 50 years ago in 1953 as an organization dedicated to the preservation and promotion of Polish culture in Milwaukee. Over the years, uh, their activities have changed somewhat from uh, participating in holiday folk fair, which they still do, uh, to now participating also in the Polish Fest down at the lakefront. Um, over the years, they've regularly sponsored 
a number of Polish cultural events such as lectures, uh, films, concerts, dramatic performances. In addition, they support uh, Polish community activities and preservation efforts. They've contributed to the restoration of St. Josephat's Basilica. On the Old South Side, the faith communities consistently stood as beacons for the residents' striving spirit. Over time, the faith communities would remain both sources of nurture and catalysts for self-discipline. The Poles in Milwaukee were known for building churches on a grand scale. One of their outstanding achievements is St. Josephat's Basilica. St. Josephat Parish was established in 1888 and actually the, the building of the, the parish buildings went along just about at the same time. Uh, the building of the basilica, well, the current basilica church, was built at the turn of the century because the first church burned down. Second church was started and was almost completed before they realized that it was hopelessly too small. Father Grutza, who was the, the pastor of the parish at the time, heard that the building of the, the old post office and customs house in Chicago was for sale. It was going to be, it was going to be torn down. So Grutza went to Chicago and bought the building, the whole building, all of the, the stones, the, uh, the ornamental ironwork, all sorts of lights and, and all the various kinds of marble pieces, bought all of that and brought it and had it all shipped to Milwaukee on 500 railroad flat cars. The parishioners themselves then did, uh, took up the task with Grutza himself as the, the general contractor. Uh, Grutza himself had uh, Erhard Bromeyer as the architect and between Bromeyer and Grutza and the people of the parish, the very people themselves, they built the church by themselves. So much so that by 1901 the, the completed church was finished. At 1908 was about the time that uh, uh, Archbishop Mesmer asked, the, uh, asked various religious orders to take over the, uh, the parish and uh, the, the response came from the, uh, the conventual Franciscans. We, are, we came in in 1910 and took over at that time. We took over $400,000 of the debt and received the, uh, the, the, uh, the deed at the same time and uh, $250,000 of the, the rest of the debt was farmed out between parishes, Polish parishes, in the Archdiocese of Milwaukee. The uh, Franciscans have been here since 1910, and it wasn't until 1914 that Father Barron, Father Felix Barron, who was the first Franciscan provincial of, of our province, came in and uh, he is the one who really oversaw the retirement of the debt and in the mid-20s, in mid-1920s, it was he who contacted uh, Conrad Schmidt Studios. The original Conrad Schmidt himself came in and started up the, the interior uh, decoration plan. It was in his term in 1929 that the, that the church was consecrated and also then at his request and the request of the Franciscans that the, the church was named a basilica. It's the third minor basilica in the United States and the only one right now in the state of Wisconsin. We see the, the tremendous sense of pride and the tremendous sense of, of, of uh, a sense of church that the Polish people had in the building of, of the church and right up until its maintenance. Over the years, there was a great deal of, uh, of heavy work that needed to be done. And in the early 1990s is when we started the, the major restoration of, of the Basilica Church. And with the help of uh, largely Polish businessmen on the south side, uh, St. Joseph at Basilica Foundation was established. And with the establishment of the foundation, there was a sense of, of the fact that once again, there was going to be uh, greatness brought about. However, the supremacy of the faith communities on the Old South Side did not emerge without struggles. The Catholicism that residents confronted in Milwaukee was not quite the same they'd known in their homelands. The residents brought a rich inventory of culturally specific Catholic practices to the neighborhood. Uh, Easter is one of the biggest holidays 
it uh, is probably bigger than Christmas. And um, Fat Tuesday or Shrove Tuesday is, is very popular. This is the day before Lent starts. And that is when everyone takes their, uh, the last of their baked goods, uh, the, the lard and the eggs and the sugar, and they make punchki, which are the jelly-filled donuts. And they fry them up and everybody gorges themselves on them. And then, of course, the next day you fast until it's time for, for Easter. Then there is uh, St. John's Eve. That's a springtime festival that is to celebrate uh, the coming of spring. It's the, the summer solstice. Corpus Christi is also, that's a springtime religious holiday. And that is where the, uh, the, the, there's a number of altars that the people go to and they, they have a mass. It's usually outdoors. It's here at the Polonia Sport Club is how we celebrate it here in Milwaukee. The earlier arriving Germans were largely in control of the hierarchy of the Roman Catholic Church when the Poles and other Eastern Europeans arrived. This led to decades of tension within the archdiocese for local parish control and a Polish voice in church policy, particularly at the turn of the 20th century. The editor of the very successful Courier Polski, Polonia's Daily, and widely distributed newspaper questioned why Polish priests were not being promoted to high office. Milwaukee's Archbishop Sebastian Mesmer called this proposition a dangerous experiment and argued that the Polish are not yet American enough and keep too aloof to advance in the hierarchy. The battle between the editor of Courier, Michael Kruszka, and the Archbishop continued for 25 years. At one point, the Archbishop established a rival newspaper and threatened parishioners with excommunication if they read the Courier. It was a big war that started over all this kind of stuff, because what they were doing was, one was, if you went to confession, they didn't even give you no absolution. That's how bad it is if you were reading the Courier. Krushka's brother, Father Krushka, traveled to Rome in 1903 to present his grievances against the German-dominated church. Between 1920 and World War II, Poles and other Eastern Europeans slowly gained concessions for culturally specific practices and expanded representation in church hierarchy. It was during these years that the Latino population began a long migration into Milwaukee's south side. Mexican Americans are now the largest cultural group in the neighborhood that had once been Milwaukee's Polish stronghold. They began to settle on the near south side in the 1920s and slowly migrated south into the area developed by Polish immigrants. Since the 1970s, the Mexican community has grown dramatically and other Latinos have arrived from the Caribbean and Central and South America. They've been joined more recently by significant numbers of Southeast Asians, especially Hmong and Vietnamese refugees, and African Americans, Arabs, and North American Indians. A number of other push-pull factors influenced the population changes. During the early 1900s, Mexican immigration to the United States expanded because of worsening economic conditions in Mexico. A large wave of Mexicans also left the country during the political and economic turmoil created by the Mexican Revolution of 1910. Beginning in 1917, the U.S. government implemented a series of immigration restriction policies to curb the influx of Mexicans, mainly in response to local claims that Mexicans, who often worked for low wages, were taking jobs away from true Americans. Although most Mexicans found jobs in local tanneries and foundries, some came to Milwaukee as strike breakers, often unknowingly. Uh, they were hired by companies intent on breaking their own labor unions, and 
the Mexicans earned the enmity of the European workers they replaced. This situation led to early discrimination against Mexican Americans in Milwaukee. Some of the uh, Polish uh, neighbors that we had were not too happy with some of the Mexicans because um, uh, they had brought, been brought in uh, in the early 20s uh, to break a strike at one of the tenneries. And they told me about um, how they had taken jobs away from some of the Polish uh, individuals who worked at, the, at those tenneries, not realizing that um, the Mexicans didn't know that they had been brought here to break a strike or to do anything, um, you know, to, to hurt other people. They were just, they were recruited, like my father in the past, were recruited to come and do a, a job here. And because they knew that Mexicans were very good workers, uh, they went down and got a whole bunch of Mexicans and, and put them to work in that factory. And given the long struggle the Poles had getting their practices incorporated into the Catholic Church, it is probably not surprising that the Latinos and Poles would experience tensions involving religious representation over the years. Tensions between the two groups, sure they exist. I think it's very hard for some of the older people, the older people of Polish descent, to see their parishes change. Uh, although it's another Catholic group coming in, it's not the same Catholic group. And so there is tension between those who have been here and who have deep roots in the parish and the new people coming in. Um, we try to work out those tensions and we try to offer people an opportunity to gather together, particularly around Christmas and Easter when they can uh, celebrate the Mass in using three different languages, Polish, Spanish, and English, and hopefully try to heal and address some of those tensions that, that may exist. During the long period of ethnic transition, a process that is still underway, tensions arose between Poles and their new Latino neighbors. Some surfaced in the neighborhood's churches, other tensions followed the rise of social protest movements in the 1960s and 70s. Right here in this park, uh, at that time in the early 60s, it was really hard for black people to come over and, and, and live here and, and have businesses here. So what we did was um, we organized marches and we participated and we'd meet the, the different um, black and Hispanic leaders over at 16th Street Viaduct. We brought them to the park here and then we voiced our opinions on why we should all live together, you know, and that was a big, big uh, part of my life and I, it was really important to do that. And some of us were working with the African American community at that time, um, including a lot of the whites from, from the South Side. Uh, but then again, that caused uh, some problems between um, some of us and our neighbors because they didn't want um, African Americans or, or, or blacks moving into the, the South Side or coming into the South Side. And at one time I thought everything was very cool and progressing along because we were getting along real well. There was plenty of jobs and everybody lived in, and kept their houses up real nice and clean. Um, and we were able to go to all the festivals uh, and the street festivals were very nice. And after that happened, like, uh, the relations trained for a little while, and then after a while it got back to normal. People began to accept that there was going to be changes in the South Side. But with all its assets, the neighborhood could not avoid changes that were occurring in the wider society. Cultural anthropologists such as Jean Baudrillard have written about specifically U.S. cultural traits such as American preoccupations with immense space, technology, and privacy. These traits were boosted in the 1950s with the proliferation of the automobile. In addition, popular TV shows such as Route 66 and Leave it to Beaver romanticized life on the highways and in more spacious suburbs. With widespread access to cars, residents on Milwaukee's south side were free to travel long distances to shop and work. They no longer needed the neighborhood. Those with economic resources could purchase homes in the esteemed suburbs. The middle class began leaving the city, and many neighborhood stores could no longer afford to stay in business. I've lived on Lincoln Avenue for 28 years, and my building houses my husband and my commercial photographic business, and we've lived upstairs. Over the years, we've seen an influx of different ethnicities in our neighborhood, and we found it was a real plus for our children to be exposed to this as they were growing up. 
Um, but there's one thing I have to admit I really miss, and that's that our neighborhood around me used to be loaded with Polish people, which had been families had been here for many generations, and they're all gone now, and I really miss those people. Um, over the years, there, there's also been an increase in poverty and crime, which do go hand in hand. Despite these sources of tension, something about this neighborhood held people together. Residents of all backgrounds described a sense of intimacy as if the South Side were a small town within the borders of a large city. I moved here because everything was so accessible, the stores on Mitchell Street, and since I didn't know how to drive, that was good for me. It's always good when you can just walk down the street three blocks down and you're there getting everything that you needed. The Lincoln Village Business Association has been operating the Main Street program since 2001. And it's really a revitalization program that uh, focuses on historic preservation. Uh, the Lincoln Village neighborhood has 98% of its original building stock in place. And we work with business owners to develop their business, startups or expansions, uh, and rehab the buildings back to their original design. It hurts to see previously proud buildings dying of neglect and sometimes you see people who will rehab a building and don't work to maintain the architectural integrity of the building and that hurts too but then we have neighbors like I do with Ben Sykerley who has taken three or four buildings on our block and rehabbed them in a great way and so seeing that done is is very exciting. What's unique about our business district is we have the Kosciuszko Park right alongside of it. It's an area that both uh, customers and residents can use during the summertime and the wintertime to their enjoyment. The things that drew me here to this Lincoln Village is the, uh, first of all, the park. It's very beautiful. And second of all, the uh, sense of community that everybody gets involved in. When uh, things get need to be done, everybody pitches in. We came to Lincoln Village because we really liked the house. We saw it. Um, the first when we saw it the first time we just loved it and moved right in and we liked that it's across the street from the park we also like the idea that our park is a living park it's used all the time there's always people in there uh, soccer games picnics the community centers being used the lagoons being used and we also really enjoyed the idea of living in a very diverse community and not just a one race community uh, one of the most exciting things to happen to our neighborhood was the addition of the cultural element which the old Southside Settlement Museum has brought to our street. Um, my building is historically significant in that it was owned by, built and owned by Roman Krasniewski who documented the Polish immigrants who came to our country during the early 1900s. When I got my building I inherited many boxes of photographic prints that he took and I couldn't bear to just throw these out and so I held on to them over the years and when the old South Side Settlement Museum came, I found a home for them. Um, the photographs were all documented with the names and addresses of the people in the photographs so now when the museum has tours, uh, the people who used to live in our neighborhood who come back to tour the museum can look for prints of their, uh, of their relatives who used to live here. And it's been a very exciting thing um, to know that these photographs found a good home. Um, so I would have to say Urban coming to our neighborhood has been one of the most exciting things to happen to our neighborhood in years. Urban anthropology has highlighted the importance of the historical uh, significance that uh, Lincoln Avenue has had and uh, has highlighted the different uh, ethnic backgrounds of the neighborhood and have uh, brought that to the forefront as, uh, as a very important thing and something that the neighborhood can be very proud of and that's one of the most important things that I see that uh, uh, urban anthropology uh, group has done for the Lincoln Village area. The neighborhood, which was sometimes perceived as intolerant of diversity by outsiders, provided a welcoming home for people fleeing political and economic oppression in their homelands. In America, immigrants of every generation often faced language barriers, poverty, and prejudice from the outside society. 
With the guidance of their faith communities, the residents of the South Side built a self-sufficient neighborhood. The diverse groups shared many cultural characteristics, explored their differences, and passed on practices of mutual support from one generation to the next. The neighborhood is currently incorporating its past into new development and restoration projects and is teeming with economic, cultural, and social activity. Perhaps the starting point neighborhood is on its way to becoming an end point neighborhood.